Welcome to another edition of Green is Good. This is the WebTech edition of Green is Good here in beautiful downtown Chicago. And I'm so honored to have as my partner today, VP of Global Partnerships and Government Affairs of GE's Water Business, Mr. John Freeman. Thank you for today. We're at our last interview of the day and you have been an amazing co-host. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your brilliance. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. And back for her second tour on Green is Good, Dr. Eileen O'Neill. She's the executive director. And the reason why we're here today, this was her idea, and we're so grateful. She's the executive director of the Water Environment Federation. This is her event here today. Welcome back to Green is Good, Eileen. Thanks, John. It's such a pleasure to be here. You know, Eileen, some people miss you. Some of our listeners and our and our viewers uh, miss you on our last interview. Can you share a little bit about your background before we get talking about all the important work you're doing with your colleagues as the executive director of the Water Environment Federation? Yes, John. Well, I'm an environmental scientist um, who got into the water business through working for the Water Environment Federation, and I have the pleasure uh, with my staff of supporting water professionals. We have about uh, 35,000 members from around the world uh, who work for utilities or technology companies like John, or consulting companies or their professors, and they um, work with WEF to share best practices and information on technologies so that the professionals can manage water better around the world. And it's an incredibly uh, fulfilling feel to be in right now. And how long have you been executive director? I have been executive director about 18 months now, but I've worked for the organization for over 20 years. Wow. And for our listeners and viewers who want to find Dr. O'Neill uh, and all of her great colleagues at the Water Environment Federation, you could go to www.wef.org. www.wef.org. My partner, my co-host, would you like to kick off uh, the interview with uh, Eileen? Eileen, I, I think the Water Environment Federation is the largest water industry professional society in the world. We're certainly the largest water quality um, organization of professionals. The American Water Works Association has um, a, few, few, a few more members than we do, uh, reflecting, I think, that there are more water systems than wastewater systems. But we do have the uh, largest annual water quality event uh, worldwide. Which is? Which is WEFTEC 2015, and we're here in, in Chicago, and uh, we have a record uh, size on the show floor, 312 thousand sold square feet of exhibit oh. space to 1038 companies and uh, as How many of people coming uh, as of today uh, over 24,300 so I am hoping we're going to break 25,000 but my staff please don't tell my staff I said that because uh, they get a little nervous when they hear hear me making uh, figures like predictions like that. How does 24,300 compare to other events in the world? Yeah. Um, well, in of an, I would say of, a, of an event of this type, um, we, are, we exceed because we don't just offer the exhibition, but we have a very strong um, technical program where there are papers given and workshops, and there's nothing of this magnitude. There are some trade shows that probably um, would approach us in terms of attendance, but they're not annual events. So I think it says something about water and water now in the US and Chicago as a global destination that we are exceeding all records that we've ever had. Well, again, I just want to say before we get into all, all the other important things that we're going to talk about today, Eileen, thank you for inviting us. It's been an honor to be here today. The quality of people that we had a chance to interview and share with our audience members has been just simply incredible. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for the invitation. And we hope to be able to be involved as long as you want us to be involved in the future. So thank you very, very much. You're welcome, John. But as I said, water people are special. They are water special. I can tell from just both of you. Um, you know, uh, and I think one of the top issues that we've been discussing today has been uh, water as a resource and, uh, and energy neutral neutrality and resource recovery. Um, you want to share some of your macro thoughts on resource recovery and energy neutrality with regards to the topic of water and recycling of water? Yes, indeed. Well, um, I would say we're at the cusp of a revolution 
um, in water practice and water treatment. And we at the Water Environment Federation, uh, as I told you last time we spoke, we no longer use the term wastewater treatment. We have banned that from our vocabulary because um, we believe that what used to be known as wastewater treatment can and increasingly is resource recovery. And one can recover um, nutrients and energy and um, water to be reused and uh, uh, be a more sustainable sector and also bring value to municipalities. And we began with energy because um, it just seemed to us with um, wastewater treatment or water resource recovery being such an energy intensive practice that there were great opportunities there to uh, minimize energy use and even to harvest back uh, the energy from uh, the used water. Gotcha. So, so Eileen, how much uh, energy is used to, to treat wastewater? Well, um, I think a statistic around moving, um, treating water and wastewater um, is, you know, two, two to four percent of the energy used in the U.S., but it can, in a municipality, it can be 50 percent of the energy used um, in the municipal system to wow. actually treat the wastewater, but it doesn't have to be that way. You've probably met some people today, John, yes. who have told you that they are, they are shifting to the being... The tide is turning. The tide is turning. The tide is, the tide is turning. Um, I hear anything from two, four, five percent of the energy needed to treat wastewater actually being there being two to, to four to even five percent more energy embedded in the wastewater yeah. than is actually used to treat that and um, as I say it feels like where there's some, some momentum here I think you probably feel it too John in GE that that the tide is turning that that's more and more of a recognition there that we can and should be operating this way I've read about the concept of Biogas, B-I-O-G-A-S. Oh, biogas. Biogas. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I didn't understand what it meant when it came to water. I saw that in the, our notes. What? What is? What, talk about the concept of biogas and and uh, water recycling. Well, um, uh, some of the energy contained within the wastewater is contained in organic matter in the wastewater and as one treats that wastewater we concentrate the solids and as one uh, purifies those solids um, gas is generated methane gas and that can be collected and either cleaned and used as a gas or used to generate electricity so the plants with the biggest potential to actually be um, putting energy back into the grid system are those ones that are practicing something we call anaerobic digestion and information we have is that only 20 percent of the plants that are actually generating biogas are actually using it to generate electricity that's in the u.s and that's something we're trying to change we're trying to get more of them actually uh, using that gas either as a fuel or to generate so let's electricity. hear it out so you have the old paradigm of energy net neutra um, net negative now you have where we, where we are now today, sort of the, the, the technology that exists that a, a lot of people are trying to leverage, which is energy neutrality. But you're saying the future really holds energy positive using, using the biogas methodology and the anaer anaerobic technology to be energy positive. That's correct. And we have plants that are energy positive here in the US, they have them in the UK. I know GE has worked with some systems in the UK. They have them on the continent of, of Europe. And um, that's the way that some of those plants are doing that by, are by accepting other organic waste. So things like food waste, and they're putting them in that those digesters and they are generating more gas. And that, that enables them to provide better value to their customers there. They get um, tipping fees to, to dispose of that food waste, and right. then they're generating electricity. Got it. I mean, did, you, you said that 20 percent of the plants that are generating biogas are converting to electricity. What are the others doing? Some of them are still flaring it, John, and what a terrible waste that is. They're ah. just disposing. So that's one of the things WEF is working on is to find out what are the barriers to um, actually using the bio, why, why aren't more people doing it? Is it, do, is it, a, is it a, a, um, a, a capital problem? Is it a technology problem? Do we need to build regional systems? Mm. But that's something that's sort of part of our mission is to share best practices and advanced uh, right. practices. Right, right. And so what percentage of 
I don't know how to say it without using the word wastewater treatment. Water plants. resource recovery. Water listen. resources recovery plants in the U.S. are actually uh, extracting uh, biogas from their wastewater today. Well, if you s there's about um, let me have a look. there's about 1,200 um, systems that have biogas generation, and 20% of them are using it. So it's so in the few hundreds. Out of about 16,000. But of course, you have to think about. There are 16,000 treatment plants in the country, mm. but a lot of them are very small. So you have to be about a, a 1 MGD plant that's about a, a, a community of about 10,000 people to actually be, have the critical mass to use this technology. But for the future, um, there, are, there are different kinds of advances. You know, things are sort of leapfrogging. There are different kinds of advances, I think, that are going to provide different, different, even different kinds of treatment technologies, which will be much, much less energy intensive. Gotcha. Um, you know, one, one of the terms that we've talked about a lot today with, with, with various guests from different backgrounds is utility of the future. What does that mean to you, Eileen? To me, personally, it means a, a different kind of a view of um, what used to be called a wastewater treatment plant. And our members, a lot of them are engineers, so yeah. they don't like to be out there in the limelight. They want to be behind the scenes you know, solving problems. But it means being uh, and, and out of sight, out of mind, you know, right. you know just, tr just managing that waste. <laughs> Um, it means to being much more a visible partner in the community mm. and being out there working with the, the customers mm. and explaining um, what it is we do and how it is we provide value to communities and in fact providing value in different ways through um, should I say providing energy, recovering nutrients and being an understanding of the, of the fact that, that this is a vital community service and also that it impacts the, the quality of life in the community and can be um, an important part of a community's overall sustainability. And we have some examples here overseas and even in this country where the utilities are um, uh, going out and engaging with the community in, in ways they, they have never before. I don't, John, if you've been to the um, Alexandria Renew facility that's the, that's the, the uh, utility that serves the, the city of Alexandria where we're located. And it is, it's not a large utility, but it's one of the most forward-looking utilities in the country. And they have, they're building a new headquarters, and it's going to be a community center and also meeting space for the community. And they have um, just, uh, putting in a, just about finished putting in a huge treatment system to remove move nitrogen to very low levels needed to protect the Chesapeake Bay. And what they did was they put that system in underground and on top of the, the tanks they put a soccer field because it's, there's a shortage of green space wow. in the community. So if I contrast that with how they operated you know, even 20 years ago, 15 years ago when I, when I, when I joined the profession, it's just a very different um, view as a community resource. Hmm. And Eileen, you know, as a professional society, WEF shares examples like Alexandria with your global membership? We do. We, and one of the ways we try, to, we try to provide value is by distilling those lessons learned and maybe um, trying to get the profession to understand, well, why Alexandria? What were the factors that enabled them to be successful? And also to share best practices globally because um, we're doing some things very well in the U.S., and then there are other things we can learn from um, from the rest of the world. And that's one of the things we're trying to do through WEFTEC is to um, bring the people world together. To world together, and so not all municipalities mm -hmm. here are able to travel, go to go to Austria and go to Germany and right. and uh, visit there. We're trying to, um, as much as possible, give our members in the U.S. access to to a global perspective here at WEFTEC. You know, obviously you were kind enough to invite us and have John and I do these interviews today, but how is the mainstream media um, recep you know, receptive to everything you're discussing? Is water becoming as cool as a Tesla and the electric cars yet, or as solar and solar city? Is water on the precipice of that coolness? Or how do you perceive how the media is covering these important and critical issues for the sustainability of the planet at large? Well, I think, um, sadly, the uh, crisis in California has, and, and 
um, some of the, the intense weather events we've yeah. had have drawn attention to um, to water and we're getting um, up on the agenda and visibility. Um, we're, we, um, I think, need to do a better job of communications. I, I say to um, our members sometimes that when I came to the Federation 20 years ago and was dealing with mostly male engineers, I never thought that I would spend as much time talking about relationships and communication mm. as I do. And, and I think that's just something we need to be better at mm. is uh, communicating what it is we do and um, uh, getting more visibility. Though I think um, with the next generation, I think they get it. Um, I was in a session this morning uh, where the um, head of the state water control board for California was, and she was talking about water recycling and saying um, how people of our generation, uh, the baby boomers are, are maybe may less accepting of that, but young people are used to technology. They're aware, of, they expect, they, she said that, you know, they know where astronauts get their water from and it's right. through recycling. So I think the next generation is going to be much more open to, to the possibilities of better water management and better resource management through the kind of recycling that our members do. That is just, it's just, it's just so fascinating. I mean, is there, you mentioned, uh, you, you know, we, we look around the world to see what other countries are doing. You try to bring some of those experiences to your members here in the U.S. Are there other countries that are role models in terms of how they communicate? Well, I, I, think, it, um, I think the Australians, I mean, they, um, they had their own drought, so um, mm -hmm. they, they um, have got much more acceptance, I think, of, of recycling than we do. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had the head of the um, uh, Western Water Authority of Australia, mm -hmm. um, it's headed by a, a woman called Sue Murphy, and, and she says that her state is, is like Texas, only it, her state is big, it's four times the size of Texas. And they've been affected by climate change in a way that it's, it's um, it stopped raining in Perth, in the, the city. And what she um, described was, and, and I've talked to our members about, about this, is made so much sense to me that engineers are problem solvers. So what engineers try to bring is a solution. You know, you've got a water problem, here's our solution right. for her. But they found um, that it was much more effective to lay out the challenge to lay out the challenge to the customers and say, this, this is what we're facing. Right. What do you think we can do about it? And they, their customers were actually willing to go for more aggressive um, uh, conservation measures than they had thought would be accepted. And I think perhaps they're finding that in parts of California too, in um, San Diego, where initially there was resistance. That idea of laying out the issues and, let it, and, and being very open to public input as well as informing the public is, is a way to go. Eileen, you've had 20 years at the Water Environment Federation. You're now their leader. So you have a fascinating role and visibility on the future, but also a great look backwards. I would love to know what keeps you up at night and what worries you the most about where we are but on the other hand, what gives you the most hope about where we're going, potentially? Well, when you think about just the challenges of um, the growth in the population and climate change, um, that could certainly keep one up at night when you think about the challenges that that puts on the, the resources of the world. I mean, just to grow enough food to feed people um, and the, the challenges that there are going to be in water management. Um, so it's an incredible, it's a time of incredible challenge mm. um, to be managing water and mm. um, you know, my job is to support the people that manage right. water. But I also think it's an incredible, it's a time of incredible opportunity. So uh, my hope is that we can keep this, um, this, this momentum for change in terms of managing water more holistically um, only thinking of water as water, not thinking of wastewater as water, and make sure that we uh, make the best use of the, the water that we have and uh, recover as many much resources as possible uh, to make sure that our communities are sustainable going forward. So what do you advise your, your members uh, about how to deal with the future? What do you tell them now? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> we... we um, 
we 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 think about um, the the um, the holistic approach to water management and the uh, the opportunity to lead now, and that's you know, it's easy for me to say, but but at the time it's the time for visionary thinking and leadership and engaging with local officials, with mayors, to actually uh, seize seize the opportunity. I mean, I, I, I speak to a lot of uh, um, agency managers, general managers of municipal agencies, and a lot of them say the same thing, which is they they have an aging workforce, and they're not seeing a lot of uh, young people come coming in up through the ranks now. Are you, do you see that as well? And is there something we should be doing about that? Well, I think we all need to, again, um, position water and water management for the, for the vital uh, profession that it is. I was just in Germany um, in the summer visiting the German Water Association, and they actually brought, I, I don't know if John knows about, we have um, Operations Challenge with this very cool competition. It's um, a practical competition for people who work in wastewater systems. And we've got two teams here from Germany. One is an all-star team from across Germany, and one is from the city of Tübingen, which is a relatively small city. And when I, I said, why is the city of Tübingen paying to send a team of operators over? Right. They said, because we want to be an employer of choice, because this is not the most glamorous profession in the world, but it's the most important profession and we uh, increasingly need a, a sophisticated workforce so we hear about that as a challenge but again it's also an opportunity if we can reposition these as meaningful careers solid careers I mean we're gonna you know we're gonna be needing to treat water uh, into the future so um, it's a challenge and an opportunity always with water I think it's funny because I think uh, you know, renewable energy is considered a very hot industry and a lot of young people do seem to gravitate towards that. And in effect, wastewater is renewable energy, so maybe that's the sales pitch. Maybe, maybe. Final thoughts before we have to say goodbye? Andy? Just thank you for coming to visit us at, at WEFTEC, the, the largest WEFTEC in our history, which again to me says something about the importance of water. John? Uh, if I had 24,300 uh, people at my conference downstairs, I'd be a lot more stressed than I lead this year. <laughs> cool customer. She's a cool customer. And for our, everyone who wants to find Eileen and her colleagues at the Water Environment Federation, please go to www.wef.org. John, I want to just thank you for today, for being my amazing co-host, brilliant co-host. This was just a delightful opportunity to share the microphones with you today, and I just want to thank you for your time and energy today. Well, thank you for including me. It's been a lot of fun. Well, thank you. And for Eileen, thank you for all the great work you do. Thank you for making the world a better place. You are truly living proof that green is good. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you.